Hey church, thank you for joining us today. If you have any issue throughout this video, make sure to go in our chat and you can see a link that will take you to our Vimeo account and you can go ahead and watch the video there. Um, giving can't be any easier than it is right now, so make sure you go to Encounter Life or go to our Encounter app and you can give through that. But first, we just want to thank you so much for giving back to Encounter. And if you don't already, make sure to follow us on our social media accounts on Instagram and Facebook at Encounter Life. Lastly, our resilient groups have been going so well that we extended to a part two. Those are going to begin at the end of July and going all the way through the resilient theme. More information on that is coming soon. We are so glad that you're here with us today. Hello and welcome to Encounter. Thanks again for uh, tuning in and joining us. Hey, do us a favor, take a moment and share this video. If you're on Facebook watching, you can share this on Facebook. Um, but spread the link around, maybe text it to a friend and just invite them uh, to participate with you and me and this community in worship right now. We have the opportunity as Encounter to encounter God, encourage each other, and engage the world. And though while we are spread out across Ventura County right now, we can continue to press into that mission and we gather together um, in this moment to unite our hearts in a place of worship and prayer and study and community because uh, we believe that's what Jesus has called us to do. So would you join me in worshiping today? Christ is enough 
enough for me Everything I need is in you Oh, everything I need We sing, cry is enough for me Oh, cry is enough for me Go on and scream. 
scream it from the mountain Go on and tell it to the masses That he is God well, Jesus, thank you for the reminder that every heart is welcome, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every color is welcome in your kingdom. The poor and the powerless, those who are content, those who are in need, we are all drawn to your feet. And so that's what uh, inspires these songs from our hearts is a, is a deep desire to know you, to proclaim your goodness and your faithfulness. And these songs really do represent um, hearts that are surrendered, that are laid down before you. And we just lift up that simple word as a community today, that word hallelujah, as we are spread out across Ventura County. Glory be to God. We declare not just with our voices, but with our actions and with our lives, that you are good, that you are a great God who is in control. And we are part of your kingdom and your people here with you on earth. Thank you for that reminder today. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Encounter. So glad you can join us online. We are currently in our series called Resilient, and uh, it's just been amazing. And so what a great opportunity for us in this time uh, to talk about something that we all need is resiliency. Um, we also are ha have these resilient groups that meet. I know I have my group on Monday night, and it has been a blast. I have an incredible group of people, and we meet every Monday and talk through the message series, and it's been very eye-opening and helpful. And so if you haven't had the opportunity to do that yet, there will be an opportunity coming up here in the next three to four weeks. We're going to jump in and try and do a part two um, of our resilient groups, and I'd love for you to be a, a, a part of that. Uh, you know, God is moving uh, here at Encounter, even though it may not seem like a lot is happening, uh, just because a lot of us are stuck at home and we just see things online, but behind the scenes, things are going on, and God is doing incredible work, and maybe there's some incredible work He's doing in your life. Uh, we'd love to hear those stories, uh, but one story in particular I have for you is uh, last Wednesday over at my house, uh, we got to baptize uh, Rachel Wedekin, and Rachel is amazing. And so I want to share with you just a little bit of what she put um, on her baptism application. It says this, it, really asking her what changed in your life, and it says this. It says, what has changed in my life is my health. I was like every other young mom, working hard at raising my family and developing my career, but I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer in June of 2018. Since then, I've become so much closer to Jesus and felt his presence over me and my family during hard times. God has used my illness to facilitate a change in me to slow down, gain perspective, and realign my heart and goals. I don't rush around like I used to. I savor small moments with people I love, and I listen more intently and um, meditate often in my own thoughts. I have achieved a greater level of peace and want to serve God in any capacity he sees fit. And so she wrote that uh, before she was baptized. And then um, COVID happened. And so during this time, this is what she, she wrote me this email. And she says, I'm, I'm so looking forward to my resilient group. But in all fairness, I'll have to share with you that I found out yesterday, and this was a couple weeks ago, um, that my breast cancer has returned. I have many tests and scans and biopsies to do over the next two weeks, and I've been told to rest as much as possible. So if I miss a meeting, you'll know why, but I'd like to still be on the list of attendees and participate as much as I can. And with that, we talked about baptism. And so again, last Wednesday, we got to baptize her. And we do have a quick video of that. So if you would just watch, um, what an incredible baptism for Rachel. Wow, what, a, what an amazing time. 
Um, I would just like to, to have a special prayer for their family, um, you know, for Rachel, for her husband, Jason. They have two kids, Ethan and Ella. Uh, Ethan's in high school. I think Ellen's uh, four or five years old. And can we just pray over their family together as we uh, get started today? God, um, I thank you for Rachel, and I thank you for their family, and I thank you for all that you're doing. And we pray and ask, Lord, that you and us as a church, that we would surround them with your love, that they would experience uh, what a church is supposed to be about, which is loving one another in times of trouble and times of difficult. And uh, let us be there for her as your spirit is there for her. And we lift her, we lift her kids, we lift her husband up to you, and just pray and ask that, that through this time where she's going to have to go through um, a lot of difficult procedures, that she knows you're right there in her midst watching over her. And Lord, I pray for us today as we dig into your word, as we dig into Philippians in this resilient series, that you would open our eyes and heart to what you have for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So, um, you know, when we look at Philippians and where we're at right now, we're still in chapter 1, we're in verse 12, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But it's bleak for the church right now in Philippians. Um, Paul's in prison, and, you know, everything stopped. It's kind of like the, everything was moving forward, the gospel was being preached, and now things aren't going well. There's roadblocks, there's a lot of persecution, and it looks like there's so much defeat happening. But what we forget is there's so much more going on just beneath the surface. And I believe even for us in these times, in these days, um, we may have some of those same feelings. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, sometimes I feel like, man, the future is unknown. I don't know what is going on or what's going to happen. I feel like there's all these roadblocks, especially as being a pastor. What's the church going to look like if we can't meet? What are those things? And there's defeat and there's these, I mean, you just get in the feels of helplessness. And yet, what we have to understand is that there's much more going on just beneath the surface. That God is always on the move. In 1992, I was out of high school. I graduated in 87 working with the youth ministry of the church that I was saved in. And man, it was an incredible youth ministry. Um, we would have these Wednesday or Thursday night, not Wednesday night, we'd have these Thursday night meetings. And um, we would pack out the room with high school students. And there was this one night in particular that I still remember to this day. That night was the, the biggest night we'd ever had. Every single seat was full. In fact, there were, um, there were people lined up all against the back wall. Uh, we actually had to move chairs on the stage. So people had to sit on the stage uh, if they wanted a place to sit. And every inch of that building, probably over a thousand or just about a thousand uh, students and some parents were in that room. And you would think on something like that, what, is there some kind of sports star that comes into town or, you know, some, some influencer or some musician that's going to share some testimony, but it wasn't. It was a man named Richard Warmbrand. And Richard Warmbrand was, uh, he was basically a pastor in Romania and he was arrested for being a pastor, and he was arrested for sharing the gospel, and ended up being tortured in prison for 14 years. And I remember the, the stage was just one chair, and he couldn't stand for very long, and so he walked out real slow, and he had to be, I don't know, probably in his late 70s, early 80s then, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure, I think he died just a little bit later. But as he walked out, you could hear a pin drop in that room. All of these students just, like, they just, they, were, they wanted to hear from this guy. And as he walked out and sat in that chair, I, I, I can't even explain what it was like to hear him talk. And just the words that came out of his mouth were so comforting and loving. Somebody who had undergone incredible amounts of torture for Christ and yet had this incredible amount of love and this incredible testimony come out of his come out of his heart. In fact, he has this quote, I'm going to share it with you and kind of get a, a glimpse of who he is if, you, if you're not familiar with him. He says this, he says, it was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners when they were in prison. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. So we accepted their terms. It was a deal. We preached and they beat us. We were happy preaching. They were happy beating us. 
So everyone was happy. And that's Richard Warmbrand. But I remember this story after he told many, many stories that night, but this one story grabbed my heart in particular. Uh, at this point, uh, when he was in prison, he was, in a, a, he was more in a dorm room. He, he wasn't in solitary confinement. And in this dorm room, there were other prisoners to his left and to his right. And he said to his left, there was this young, um, this young Romanian pastor who was doing the same thing that Richard did, that they asked him, hey, tell us where the underground church is. He wouldn't. Tell, stop preaching Christ. He wouldn't. So they just began to beat him. And his face, he said, was just bloody, and his bones were all broken. He could barely walk, and he was hunched over. And all they would do is grab him during the day, go and beat them and torture them so that they would tell them where the underground church was. And at any time, if they, if they de- renounced Christ or they told them where the underground church was, they could leave, and they didn't. And so there's this young pastor just heart for Jesus is, 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 is in this bed next to him. But then on the right, uh, over here on his right, there was another man in the room, and this man was always crying. And this man was actually the torturer of this young pastor. And for some reason, he had done something wrong in his job, and they don't exactly know what had happened, but he got thrown in with the prisoners and basically was, as a torturer now, going to be tortured. And so here, I mean, you can imagine the tension in that room. What would have that been like? And this man would cry and weep every night and say, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And one night, Richard tells the story of this man, this, this young preacher, asked a friend to carry him over to the bed of this torturer. And as he carried him over, and this man was weeping, he got down on his knees, and he said in, the, in the just the sweetest way, he, he, he began to caress the torturer's head. And he began to whisper in his ear that God loves him, that God forgives him, and that he forgives him. And the man began to weep even more. And he began to tell him how much God has a plan for his life and that what he did, God won't remember if he just asks for God's forgiveness. And in the midst of this, you see this torturer and this person being tortured, building this relationship. And eventually he came to Christ and gave his heart to Jesus in the middle of prison. Man, what an incredible, like, let's just close down now. That's such an incredible story. Such an incredible thing that happened when the gospel is preached, it changes lives. And we're going to look at what happens with Paul when the gospel is preached. And we're going to look at what happens in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. It says this, it says, Now I, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, this is verse 12 of, of chapter 1. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else uh, that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of my brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Wow, do you catch that? And so here we have a picture of Paul in the midst of prison and probably some of these same things happening to Paul. And he says, and yet... There's more going on under the scene. There's more happening under that surface. So what is happening to Paul? Paul, again, he's arrested. He's in prison. There's no more movement. We're looking at the end of Acts, really. This Philippians is written about the time of Acts 28. So all this incredible stuff has happened. And now, all of a sudden, it's shut down. It's stopped. There's no movement. They're stuck, and he's sitting there. And yet, he says... Because of this, it's actually served to advance the gospel. It is advancing the gospel for him to be there in prison. What does that word advance mean? Uh, My son Cooper is in the United States Army. And uh, his responsibility is he's a combat engineer. And so as a combat engineer, uh, he has a really interesting job. So in his unit, he um, if there is any type of roadblock, His responsibility is to get rid of that roadblock so the troops can go through. So if there's a minefield, 
He's the one out there getting the mines out of the way. Sometimes they blow them up. Sometimes they have to dig them out. Sometimes they use these machines to make it happen. If there's a door, they have to breach the door. They basically put explosives around it and blow it off its hinges. Uh, whatever there may be in the way, his job is to clear or pave the way so the troops can advance. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here, that, that what he is going through is paving the way to, 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 for the gospel to move forward. Uh, Rick Mellick, he wrote this. Uh, he's a Bible scholar, and he said this. He says, um, Paul did not say that in spite of these events, but rather through them. There is a note of sacrifice here that Paul's private concerns did not matter, but the gospel did. And so it's not saying that secondary action was, well, because he's in prison, it all of a sudden expanded the gospel. No, it says because he was in prison, that was the catapult for the gospel to be moved forward. So through these things, the gospel was moved. Which brings me to another question. What really is the gospel? I mean, we talk about it a lot. We talk about the gospel of John. We talk, and we know that it's good news, but what, what does that mean? What does it really mean for us? And, and what does it mean that, that that's something we take and give to someone else? And again, gospel simply means good news or a good announcement or a good report. It's something that a king would proclaim. So if the king won a war, he would spread the gospel and say, hey, we won the war. We're going to be here for the next 20 years and we're safe. Right? And, and, or a herald would shout out good news of something that happened. That's gospel. Um, I love this quote. It says this, the Christian gospel is the announcement that Jesus is the divine king of the world who lived and died and was raised to be the ruler uh, we so desperately need. And if a new king is in charge, this means that a new way of life is in order. Do you catch that? The gospel tells of the surprising story of God's self-giving love in Jesus that has the power to change people. It is good news that is truly worth sharing. And so this picture is this, right? When we look at, at what Paul's saying, he's saying, okay, here we go. I am in prison, and because I'm in prison, it is advancing or paving the way for us, right? The church, followers of Jesus, to spread the good news even more. And for him to spread that good news in new places that they hadn't spread before. Because now he's tied up to guards, he's chained to other guards, he's chained to people. Those guards know people in influence, and as he's preaching to them, they're telling the stories of what's going on. Man, and all of a sudden the gospel is being moved. And so what we know is that through heartache and difficulties, the gospel's way is paved through the good news. And, and usually it's the heartache and difficulty of the messenger. And in that heartache and difficulty, man, we pave the way for the gospel to be preached. So when we look at Paul, like how, how then is, but he, how's he going to complete this work while he's stuck or while he's in prison? And, and, and for me, going through what we've been going through with COVID and being stuck at home, I, I think of the same thing for us. Like, how is God, God going to complete his work in us through all of these trials and through all of these things that we're going through? And I, again, I love that verse, just a couple of verses above. It's, you know, he who began a good work in you, he will be faithful to complete it. And here's it's like, nothing is going to stop his work. Nothing is going to stop his work. Even when we feel like we're being defeated or even when we feel like everything is falling apart around us, oh, man, we can, we can rest in this, that God is still at work. And again, we may not feel that way. We may be having a difficult time and that's okay because I, I get it. But we have to remember and trust and believe that under all this, behind the scenes, beneath the surface, that there is a God at move. No matter what circumstances, right? No matter what the world around me says, no matter what the world around me does, no matter, no matter if, if we meet as a church again or not ever meet as a church again. And again, I, those are terrible things to think, but really, like God began this work and he is gonna complete it. Do we give up? Do we stop? Are we any less of an impact to this world if we can't meet? 
Is God surprised by any of this? Here's something I hope you don't get offended by, but, but maybe, maybe COVID, maybe COVID is paving the way. Maybe COVID is the, is the very thing we need right now so that more people hear the gospel. Could it, could it be an invitation into new ways in living out the gospel that God has called us to proclaim to the world around us? Maybe it means something like opening up our homes to new relationships and people that, you know, before we hadn't had time to meet because we were so busy being at church and Bible study and all these different things. And all of a sudden, we have this time to actually connect. Maybe it's in, in sharing with others who are not like us and getting to know people who come from different cultures and backgrounds and discovering what they're like. Maybe it's in providing hope and healing to our neighbors and those around us that God has put us in, in just short distance from. And could you imagine? I was just thinking about this. Imagine if, if, if God was moving us towards something like this. And imagine, imagine your neighborhood and imagine all of a sudden, in your, let's say you live in a cul-de-sac and there you are with a, a swimming pool, like a portable swimming pool in the middle of your cul-de-sac baptizing your neighbors. Would that have ever happened before? I don't know. Is that what God's leading us to? I don't know. I don't know what God is doing. But the question I have to ask myself, and I hope you're asking yourself is, am I open to his leading? Am I open to what he has for me? Am I open to what he's doing in the world right now? And even if we see this COVID thing as something, yes, it is destructive and it's terrible and it's horrible. But how how can we reframe that? Uh, Philippians chapter one, um, Paul goes on and he says this. He says, he kind of switches gears a little bit here. And, and so he says this, he says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. Uh, the latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former uh, the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. And so what Paul's saying here is there's different groups of people doing different things while he's in prison and the gospel is out there. But some people disagree with Paul. Not only do they disagree, they're moving against Paul. They don't like Paul. They're using this to take advantage of Paul and his uh, influence. And so all this weird stuff is happening. And so Paul's just saying, there's people that are for me. There's people that are against me. But then he says this in verse 18. But what does it matter? What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. Oh, and because of this, I rejoice. Are you catching this? This is, a, this is an amazing verse. What does it matter? The important thing that is in every way, whether from false motives or true, that Christ's message is preached, that the gospel is preached. Now, I have a unique background. I have served in many different churches. And I've ser served in huge churches where we had auditoriums of 3,500 I mean, just giant auditoriums of, of, of seats, uh, just huge stage, lights, smoke machines, lasers, just uh, amazing technology. Uh, and I've also uh, worked and served in very small churches where they've had 100 seats or less. Uh, some of those really small, some of them maybe 50 or 60 seats. Uh, and then some in between, like Encounter, you know, we're about 1,000 people, 1,200 people. And I mean, I'll tell you, when I first was in ministry, I was extremely arrogant um, because I came from a church that had seen an uh, extreme amount of growth over the years. Uh, again, our youth group just began to multiply. And so I just assumed, because that was the only church I went to, that that's how all churches were, that there was just dynamic growth that always happened. I mean, we double our size and triple our size. The church grew from like like I think it was about 400 to about four to 5,000. And so you just think these things, like that's just a normal thing. And I used to go to these conferences and I used to speak at these conferences and talk to people. And, and if they were from a small church, I remember thinking, oh man, yeah, you don't even understand. Like, we, yeah, we, we're from the big, like we know how to do church. Like we're, yeah, we got this. Like you can learn from us. And just so arrogant and so terrible. And I remember then also going to conferences where I'd sit with people and these guys from small churches would look at me and go, your church is so shallow. 
You guys maybe have thousands of people, but no one even loves Jesus. No one's giving. No one even cares about God. They just come in because they like to be fed and leave, and they, they don't even know who Jesus is. And so you'd have small churches ripping on large churches, large churches ripping on small churches. And then let's talk about worship styles. Man, you have people say, oh, that's a too emotional style. Uh, that's a too showy style. They have so much, oh, there, there's lasers, there's smoke, there's this, there's that, there's too much of this. Oh, they're manipulating people with voices. And then you have churches that are small group focused. And it's all about the small, well, if you don't do small groups, you're not really doing church. Or, hey, if you don't focus on the Bible, if you don't have deep Bible study, then your church means nothing. Some churches are focused on the weekend. The list goes on and on and on. And we all critique. And we all have preferences. And we all have these experiences. And again, there's nothing wrong with having preferences or experiences. But it is wrong when we expect other people to be that way and other people to do that way and other people to be like us. And that's a dangerous thing because God made us all different. I know for me, one of the fa my favorite things to do, and you're going to think I'm crazy, is I love getting in the garage and working on my car. I love, I have this old Jeep that I, I love working on. And it's a piece of, I mean, it's nice, but it's okay. But I love taking it apart, fixing it, upgrading it, doing those things. And here's the thing. I feel so close to God when I do that. That is my place of retreat. I go there when I want to spend time with the Lord. And as I'm working and restoring this car, I feel like I'm being a part of it. Like I'm being a part of like doing what God does. I'm restoring something. And I have these conversations and this deep, meaningful time with the Lord. Now, what if I said to you, hey, you know what? If you don't work on your car, you're not following Jesus the right way. You're not, there's no way you could understand God the way I do because you don't know, because God works with us all in different ways. Just like I, I, I pay attention to my kids in different ways. They have different needs and I approach them based upon their needs. And our communication is based upon who they are and who I am and how we connect. That is the same with God. And so I love what Paul says here because he says there's, there's all these different things going on, but but where is God moving? Where is the gospel being preached? And where that's happening, then I'm good. I'm good with that. And here's the thing. God is not confined to work in our preferred method. He is not, let me say that again, he is not confined to work in our preferred method. Because in spite of it all, God is working in people. And again, I've been to some amazing, amazing churches that have some amazing problems. But God is working in spite of it all. And God is working even when the church doesn't seem like it's working so well. God is working in spite of it all. All of us are broken. All of us are messed up. And he allows us to accomplish his purposes. That's one thing he's given us. But we're not perfect. And so Paul says our, our, our motives can still be wrong, but God still wins. Did you catch that? Our motives can still be wrong, but God still wins. And that should bring us so much comfort. That should bring us so much comfort because if, if we think we have it right in method, right? If we think we have everything down perfectly, then we are assuredly very, very wrong. And so that should bring us comfort to know that God works. So I, I'm unsure. I'm unsure what's going to happen in all of this. But I can trust that God knows and that he is at work and that he is at work in our lives. So just a few takeaways for us. A few things just to remember, I have two, is number one is this, and this one may hurt a little bit. Um, my preferences and criticisms about church do no good for my growth, people, or the gospel. Now, now let me say that again. My preferences and criticisms about church and, and, and I don't mean just about this church. That, I mean any church, right? If I'm looking around and I'm looking at other places and ripping things apart that I don't understand or know or know the people personally, and the gospel is there, and people are coming to know, who am I? So my preferences and criticisms about church do no good for my growth. They do no good for people, and they do no good for the gospel. So, so here's what I say. Discover where God is moving and join him in the work. Where is he moving in your neighborhood? Where is he moving here? Where is he moving in your group, in your group of friends, wherever that is, and join him in, in, in that work. And, and would you be willing, 
Would you be willing to surrender your preference, my preference for the sake of the gospel? Would you be willing to do that? Number two is this. Would you also be willing to reframe your struggles? Be willing to reframe maybe the way you're looking or I'm looking at how our world is unfolding before us right now. Because we can get real negative real quick and we could think it's all falling apart and we could think someone has lost control and we can lose it. And God's like, no, 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 no. I am working underneath the surface. Help us to see things, God, in a different light. So pray that God gives you eyes to see. Maybe to see what's going on around you in your neighborhood, in your family, at your workplace. And maybe he may reveal something that you didn't see before. Sound good? Let's pray. God, may, may, you, may you work in our lives this week. May you just begin to show us um, maybe where we're a little critical of others um, and help us to see that you're at work in those places. Help us to see that you're moving in places that, um, that aren't our preferential way of doing things. And then not only to understand and know that, but to rejoice in that. To know, God, that you are right now moving in a powerful way uh, in our community. And we may not see that, but help us to see that by reframing, God, the way we see the world around us. By reframing COVID, by reframing all of the things that are happening and all of the things that it, it, just, it just seems like everything's falling apart. Help us see those things with your eyes and to know that you are always there, amazingly working below the surface. There's this undertow of your spirit moving and leading us and guiding us. We thank you so much for that. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. You guys have a great week. I'll drink from Oh, he is my song Let the king of my heart Be the shadow where I hide The ransom for my life Oh, he is my song Cause you are good Good Oh, you are good Good of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song cause you are good you're good Oh, yes, you are good, you're good. Oh, yes, you are good, yeah, you're good. Oh, yes, you are good, you're good. Oh, cause you're never gonna never gonna let us down you're never gonna let you're never gonna let us down you're never gonna let you're never gonna let us down you're never gonna let you're never gonna let us down she are good you're good oh Oh, 
never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Father, thank you for the reminder that though we may not always see, you are with us. You've never abandoned us. You will never leave us or forsake us. You actually walk with us through the trial, through the fire. It will come, the storms will come, but you will not abandon us in it. So we... We just lift up this song as a, as a prayer that reminds us that you're the mountain where we run, the fountain that we drink from. We hide in the shadow of your wing. You're the ransom for our life. You're the wind that pushes us, the anchor that holds us, the fire that burns inside of us. And that's the reason that we sing together today to declare these truths, to remind ourselves of these truths of who you are. So thank you that even in the storm, even in the trial, we can sing that you are good. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks again for joining us. We hope you have an amazing week. We'll see you next week in here at Encounter.